Good. Yeah, we should be good. Very loud or not very loud? Very loud. Okay. Thank you. And if everybody now will join, Well, I propose that we move comments to members of the community 6.0. So I say skip 6.0, 9, and 10. Thank you. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm looking in our gallery and in our chat, and at this time I do not see any hands raised. I'll remind any attendees and participants if you'd like to make a public comment to please raise your hand in the attendees space or make a comment in our chat box so that we can acknowledge you and uh, give you your three minutes. There's uh, nobody at this time with their hands raised or has, has made a comment to publicly speak. There is uh, just one person in attendance online at this time. Thank you. All right. Um, so again, I remind you, we will have the opportunity in just a little bit. Um, to open that up for comments for the community again. Um, before we jump to our, our main uh, topic here, I do want to just um, quickly note to uh, the community that we receive emails. Um, we are watching and aware of stressors and stressors regarding COVID and COVID testing, accessibility testing, the equity issues around testing. Um, I know that Dr. Bassett is continuing to work hard and communicating uh, closely with the health district and other uh, medical personnel that, that have the weekly call. Also, um, I'll offer here, if you will, give us a quick update if you don't mind on just where we are with the pool testing. But I have also been reaching out to local um, city officials who have been in the Charlottesville area, such as somebody. Um, at EVA last week, who is the director of pediatrics there. Uh, so, just as a reminder to families, if start with, we'll start with EVA, if you are in the EVA system, if you want and can reach out to your pediatrician, the point is only as of last week that there was uh, testing, COVID testing going on from five to eight on Wednesday Friday at the Battle Bay local pediatrician. Um, also, one that I spoke with said, you know, if you call up and you see the child is symptomatic, we will do our best to get them in the same day for testing. And then I've also seen you know, pediatrics throughout the state are packed. Uh, and, you know, everybody is feeling the impact of uh, and the demand of needing to be tested. So, um, we have sent 
sensitive to that? Is everybody sensitive to that along those lines? Do you continue to wear your masks? Your students and your friends and your family to wear your masks, not just wear your masks, but wear it properly because wearing it properly matters. And that, that's where we get the protection from. So, on, on behalf of, of all of our students who we want to keep in our school books, please be due diligence and, and keep each other safe. And Dr. Baptist is going to give us a quick update on where we are with the school testing and anything else we might have. Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Odie. Um, I did have a meeting today with the health department, and everything that um, Ms. Torres just said is correct. I do know that the UVA docs, because of the um, overwhelming number of patients, are trying to uh, prioritize symptomatic children versus asymptomatic to keep the sick children who have to be in the same spaces. So rather than just going, it is a better idea to call and make sure that uh, they can see you at that time. Um, we have a, a meeting tomorrow with the vendor that's been selected for Charleston for the pool testing, EMED. I uh, don't know a lot about the process at this point, but we will have a meeting tomorrow to see what some of the next steps are and to make sure this is still something that uh, we feel is important for, well, we know it's important, but what we think is our uh, uh, best use of resources for Charleston City Schools. Uh, some divisions are choosing not to do the pool testing route because they're seeing it as an add-on mitigation or taking up resources. And so we want to make sure that the resources, human and otherwise, um, will be utilized effectively and hoping that uh, we will receive some assistance, both financially and in human uh, resources for this pool testing. It won't be an uh, extra task for our own staff members which that's the way it's been explained. So we want to make sure we can meet with them. That is still the case. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey Gallus at UVA has done a women's job of a lot of different things that he's been doing. I've talked to him numerous times throughout the pandemic about various issues with uh, COVID. He is trying to um, do more teams out in the community called strike teams. This is primarily UVA, and I think maybe some others too, who are doing this on their own time. They're still working their own schedules and then had it helping to set up testing at different sites. One was done last week at Jack Jewett Middle School. We're doing one here at Charlottesville High School Thursday afternoon. We're going to start setting up at 5. The actual testing event will be from 6 to 7.30, and we'll be doing it somewhere around the opening of CO2. I realize all of us in here now have a school board meeting at five o'clock Thursday, but, but if it's short, and I know it can be, then we can all go downstairs and help with the testing when that is over. Um, but so we're all we're being asked to do is somebody to help with parking, just help with the logistical pieces of it. And Dr. McDowell's again is trying to do this in different parts of the community. So this is the first time we've done it like this with Charlottesville, but I have told them I knew that we would have the support, so I hope we do it additional times as needed. So those are where we're doing some of the testing. Still, the thing we need done is vaccination, and Friday here at the high school will be the second vaccination for the group that we had get their first vaccination on September 3rd. If there are any students or families that would like to get that first shot Friday here at Charlottesville High School, I asked Dave about a link, and I haven't heard back from the health department. If I get it while we're in this meeting, I'll let you know again. But if someone um, would like to get that first shot by Friday, you can contact me at uh, beth.bassus at charlottesvilleschools.org. I will make sure that you get the information that you need for getting that first shot on Friday. Any questions? Yeah, one quick question about the doctor. So, remind me, um, I heard again as recently as today regarding um, support for students who might be struggling with transportation to get to testing. Do we, are we trying to coordinate any or do we have any, any resources to help or where are we at with that? Um, there's no set program for that, but we have told families and we've told. Um, doctor's offices that if they know of a family within Charleston City Schools who needs that support, if they let us know, 
and we will work with our uh, social workers, our social emotional folks within our schools to do what we need to do about getting assistance for that. So there's no set you do this and we'll do this, but let us know what you need and we will work to make sure that that, that happens. Um, I don't know whether some of the testing in the future outside of the full testing can be done you know, during school hours. Again, this the, the testing Thursday evening is by employees at UVA who are doing this on their own time. One of our parents, who's also a UVA pediatrician, Dr. Emily Wong, is sort of um, handling a lot of the logistics on this one because Dr. Dallas is in clinic all afternoon. But um, so different doctors are trying to work on the strike team to get the testing out and out. So we'll try to do what we can. We just need to know what the need is. Thank you. I mean, I appreciate your effort. I appreciate um, parents' efforts. I think it never hurts to just keep asking people. Um, and that's kind of what I started to do is to call people and ask, like, do you have any capacity to come in and help us in the schools? And I hope that we can continue to move forward with the school testing. Obviously, we don't want to ask um, more onto our own employees, but I hope that that does involve, you know, the human resources to help support that testing. But I also feel like we need more than that, you know, to keep, not just us, I mean, everybody, every school division, you know, how we get um, vaccinations approved for our younger kids, we need to have access to testing. And unfortunately, I think the resources, you know, we're pivoted to vaccine support. You know, some some of the grant, a lot of the grant money, I think, probably is pivoted that way. And so there's some of those issues that, that we probably aren't even aware of, you know, where the vaccines have flowed, and that's unfortunate. I mean, the, the test has flowed. Um, so anyway, I just want to say thank you to everybody, and thank you again to you, and thank you, board, for allowing me to just bring this up. But I feel like COVID, we need to keep this, you know, forefront and keep this conversation open. Um, so thank you. One other thing I thought about, um, with the hope that we will get the okay for the 5 through 11, ages 5 through 11, for testing hopefully later this week or next month, uh, the, the plan right now is that it will not be done through in school clinics like we did the H1N1, but will likely be done on, in pubs, um, like on the weekends or something. I feel sure they may ask us to host this a hub, which if they do ask, I will say yes, because I know I will have volunteers to come help with that. Um, but they have not, they were talking about this afternoon and not 100% sure how they will do it, but they're not thinking that we will line up all the kindergartners to give them a shot, which makes me hurt to think about doing it that way. But we will work on that. And questions will also ask about um, the, the boosters, don't know what all the plans of that are going to be, but we're certainly a uh, player and being a part of however it is done. One question was asked, I've already heard before, but in case the public has this question, if you took Moderna and we now have the Pfizer closer to being available for the booster, do not take the Pfizer if you had Moderna as your first and second shot. Um, wait till the Moderna information comes out. That was mentioned again this afternoon. Any other questions? I think I have a question and it's COVID related. And it, I'm just putting it out there because that's Googling a lot. So this is a really more area, but when we're talking about the kids who are quarantined or out because of the COVID exposure, um, there's, I just didn't get any messages from people about sometimes if the whole class has to shut down and the teachers available, um, they can be virtual. But I'm just trying to get an idea of the number of students who are not virtual but are quarantining because it seems like that's a lot of disruption. I don't or, you know, know. Sir. Yeah. I don't have a number on that. I will tell you at all of Charleston City Schools, we've only had to close one class throughout the division. That class was closed for two weeks. There was not an outbreak in that class, but there were three separate uh, cases that likely came from home exposures. There was nothing to say that the exposures happened within that class. I can't tell you for sure whether it did or it didn't. But we closed the class because most of the class have either been exposed or, or we had the three cases. 
That's the only class of frauds and seizures that is closed. Um, as far as the numbers quarantined, we're not quarantined as many or counting as many as close contacts at this point because people are getting better about wearing the mask and wearing it appropriately. So before we call someone a, a close contact, they have to be unmasked, they have to be less than three feet in, inside, and um, to have been together unmasked less than three feet for more than 15 minutes cumulatively. And we're working very hard to make sure those conditions do not happen in our classroom. So occasionally we do have a person or two that needs to quarantine, mainly because of possible exposure at lunch, because that's where we do not have masks on. But um, I can't tell you the number who are quarantining right now, but I do not think it is as high this week as maybe it was the week before last when we were still getting even more used to proper use of the masks. But um, we're, I mean, I keep, I know the ones who are quarantined because of school, you have to go find them talent for you, but um, I just don't think there's many right now because we're doing a better job with some of our education. Is there any way to track that number or add it to our tracking? We've talked about doing that, and to be honest, I, I haven't gotten it done. If it is something that you're doing happening. a lot, well, mm -hmm. but if it's information that people need to know, then we will get it done. I can't from right this moment tell you what that number is, but I can work to try to get that number tracked. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question. Um, regarding the class that you just spoke about, uh -huh. did the teacher do virtual with those children yes. for the two weeks? Okay. Well, uh, all but one day, the teacher was still one day not COVID related okay. to the So the procedure is if this happens again and the entire class has to quarantine, they will be allowed to do virtual in order that they not fall behind. Okay. That was the plan for that class, and I can't tell you that 100% that would happen. It would depend on the teacher. If the teacher is ill, then we would have to come up with a different plan for that. But in this case, the teacher was well and could uh, do the virtual with the students, so we would hope we would be able to do that. Are our students three feet or six feet apart in the classroom? In the classrooms, the contact tracing distance is three feet. If you're outside, it moves to six in some situations, but three to six. Inside, it's three feet. Okay. And we are trying to keep that distance at three feet. If we're not at three feet, we are masked. Oh, thank you. Uh huh. Yes, about some kids who are having trouble remembering the masks properly, and in some cases, maybe that has contributed to um, transmitting the virus. And how does that happen? It depends on the age of the child and the reason for not wearing the mask. There's a difference in just not being able to tolerate the mask and not being willing to tolerate the mask. So, so not wearing the proper Not wearing, well, a lot of people. I've seen a lot of people protecting their chins throughout the pandemic. Um, teachers are just, and administrators are being vigilant about reminding them about wearing the mask. And I know that we have had the face shields that are also available with not a suit's mask, but are better than nothing. And if it's a willful not wearing the mask, then there could be disciplinary consequences for that. Dr. Beth, I have a question. You can refresh my memory. What are we doing for those students who are at home, you know, recovering from COVID in terms of making sure that they cannot fall in the time or what? What what's the responsibility of the teachers? We've asked the teachers to uh, prepare work for the students, and but we one thing we need to look at is the child at home quarantined and asymptomatic so that they can continue doing work, or are the students um, sick and not able to do the work? So we, we do ask the teachers to make sure that work is available and they tell parents, you know, if they want to come to the school to pick up the work, that we can you know, work it out with the teacher and we will do that. So it is so that the teachers, you know, contact the parents. I don't know that we've actually or, said teacher contact parent or parent contact teacher, but we just need to make sure that they're working together. Okay. And some parents may not really want the kids to have work if they're sick or whatever else, but we want to make sure it's available for any family who wants that work. Okay. Any other questions for members? Um, 
Um, I just had a comment. I, I spent some time this morning at Johnson Elementary School um, helping the kids, you know, as they get out and they find cars, probably under several dozen probably cars and they open the door. I know that these, these, these kids, they were very diligent in putting their masks on before they got out the car. And, you know, I know that this is not a, um, you know, a valid survey or anything, but just that, I know that, that the kids are, they're going to be kids, but at least this morning, every kid that came out the car, they had the mask on. And I know cars throughout the whole day to keep them off. These, these kids, they started off with them on. The vast majority are, are doing exactly what they need. And um, kids sometimes forget. Occasionally, I walk out into the hall and go, oh my gosh, I don't have my mask on. I start tapping up my face to, to go wherever I'm going. I mean, it's, but I think most people that are trying to do what we need to do. Thank you. Before the moment, I'm sorry, everybody, that you didn't want to ask that's coming up. So thank you. Sure. All right. Um, moving on to item for discussion. So here we are with our, our budget work session. Um, and thanks uh, for those of you who have prepared the documents and um, Powell. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Odie. Um, so I, the, the format for this topic. This evening is basically I'm going to provide you with some background information. A lot of this uh, information you've seen before, but it's important that everyone's grounded in some of the, the foundational information before we get into the real purpose of this discussion. So um, the information I'm going to share with you will take about 10 minutes to kind of go through. And again, a lot of it will take a lot of them look familiar, and then um, we'll go into discussion. So uh, the first uh, slide that you should be looking at is just the recap. Good afternoon, Black Knights. We are in the building and are riding the afternoon five o'clock bus. Please start making your way to the front of the building. Again, all Black Knights in the building. If you need afternoon transportation to the five o'clock bus, please make your way to the front of the building. Have a terrific Tuesday. Thank you, Dr. I. So, um, this uh, first slide is what you saw back at your May retreat, and it just summarizes the different uh, grants or awards, if you will, of. Um, the federal dollars, and it's my understanding that we are unable to project today in the um, media center. So Leslie is projecting for the audience at home, and I did make sure everyone who's present does have a paper copy of the presentation. I am the second, yeah. So, yeah, and if it'll help, I'll do this one of these kind of pointer things that we get through. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a little, little different format. We haven't had this before, but you know what? We're, we're good in Charlottesville and adapting, if, if anything. COVID is taught us to go constant is change and we adapt. So, um, so this just shows you the, the three different awards with the third award being the most significant, the 10 million. Um, so that, that's just free information. The next slide, and again, these are things you've seen before. I just want to go through them quickly. It talks about that large grant, the ARP, ARPA, um, the, the um, acronym is ARPA, it's ARPA, ARPA, SR3 funds. And that paragraph at the top talks about the intended uses of those funds. So I just wanted you to have that handy. Uh, in conjunction with that, with those funds, we publish our safe return to learn plan, which is available on our website. And then we also have our current intended uses for those funds, which were largely tied to the FY22 budget development. Um, but of course, that's all going to be subject to changing discussion as we go along over the next several years. Um, so this next slide, the good news and challenge slide, this is also something from the retreat, although I have updated the number to reflect the final transportation number that we settled on instead of the 600 and some odd thousand that we discussed at the retreat in May. You may recall the city manager had the counter proposal for 332,000 as a pilot program over two years, so that's reflected here. But uh, again, the good news is when the board was working on the fiscal year 22 budget. We knew the social emotional learning was going to be there, the academic learning loss, and the items that were put into the FY22 budget were all connected with things that the ARPA funds were intended to support. So that was good. Of course, the challenge is um, dealing with the non recurring nature of those funds and how we manage 
uh, a transition, if you will, to the current fund where needed over the next several years. The slide below that, the one that has the yellow green box, it talks about city support for schools. And I think not a budget year goes by where we don't talk about the fact that the city funding is the foundation and it's the key to get to our success in the school division. This is true for every locality, whether it's no matter county or city, the, the local support is, is defined in the school and the educational programs. And the messages in the yellow and green boxes were in almost every budget presentation we gave last year. Um, just important reminders about the significant impact that the team has had on our community and our school community and our students. And then the caution about the non-recurring revenues. That was in all of the presentations. And so again, we're not dealing with anything we didn't see coming. And um, so it's just a matter of making good decisions as we move forward. Last call, the bounce back bus, students are in the building, you can be up front, the bus is safe ready to leave. Last call for the five o'clock bus. Have a great afternoon. Okay, so the next slide is the one regarding the Blue Ribbon Commission on Sustainable School Funding. And this is just something that we like to include because it it that the work that was done on that study that concluded in 2014, all of that work still holds true to this day uh, with regard to the fact that you know what it takes to maintain and sustain our programs and respond to student needs is something in the order of two to four million additional per year. That was what they had forecast or foretold if you would in, the, in that work um, that the city and the commission did back in 2014. Um, I think it speaks to the quality of that work that you know, that's still something we refer to today. It still holds up. So the next slide that says CCS budget and city appropriations, and again, this is all materialist from prior presentations. This simply shows the average annual increase in the city appropriation for schools was, in fact, between two and four point two and four million. It was an average of two point three million from twenty fifteen to twenty twenty. So that's that's just for their there to reference against that new ribbon commission um, projected range of two to four million. Now we're going to start to move some new material. <laughs> that was all just. Um, this next slide is one that should look very familiar because you just saw it at the council and board work session on September 15th. And the reason that this slide is in here, uh, in, in particular, what's something that stood out for, for me was that um, it references a five cent uh, increase in um, a potential increase in the property tax rate to cover the four, uh, four point five million dollar school operational increases. That's the four point five million that comes up. In Current discussion with the city council, it's, it's an area of concern. I did not, um, you know, know that that was going to be part of their presentation. I thought it was interesting. I know several of you were all were also intrigued. We're just going to put a pin in that for right now, and um, it'll come up when we get to the, our when we, have, when we get into the bigger discussion. But I just wanted to include that slide because it certainly caught my attention, and um, and I know we'll, we'll have some we'll look forward to a better understanding of what all what, what all that means. So then the next slide is this one called budget ramps and bridges. And I hope this is helpful. It may not be, but um, you know, I'm working on things late at night and the next campaign. The first box shows the current federal non-recurring revenues. And it's in this, this graphic is intended to represent how we have to flip those, you know, potentially flip that non-recurring revenue into recurring revenue to the extent that we maintain all of those programs and expenses as they are in that kind of budget. So that first rectangle diagram is, you know, what I call flipping the ramp. Because what we talked about during the FY22 budget development process is the fact that because of the, the, the dollar value of funds that was coming into the federal government and the fact that it can extend out until this, the use of those funds can reach out to fiscal year 2025, although that last year you have to finish spending by September 30th, 2024, but that's still touching the fiscal year 2025 budget. There's an opportunity to use those funds to provide a ramp, if you will, for local revenues to recover and, and settle out, if you will, know, over time. Because one of the biggest challenges we all dealt with in the FY22 budget development process is just the uncertainty of what you know, the future holds. And I know the city feels that uncertainty as well. So that's the picture of what it looks like to just flip the ramp. And honestly, if it was just as simple as converting 
the, the non recurring funds and the recurring funds the time frame we have to do, it would be easy. If it was just that simple, it would, it would, it's because then we would know, you know where expenses were going to be, even if the expenses and the revenues were not level, because that would be unrealistic. But even just knowing what they would be, it, we, we could plan accordingly. In three years, it would be relatively simple. The issue is we don't know with certainty what the revenues and expenses would be. What we do know is that there would be increases in our discretionary expenses. So the picture on the other side is talking about the bridging. The bridging is the dotted line around the corner. And that's where whatever happens with our revenues and expenses, the net additional expense, we have to bridge to that. And the unknowns around that, I think, are what make everyone involved, you know, um, apprehensive on the city side and on our side as well. So that's the part, that's where the work really happens. Because just, just looking from non recurring to recurring revenues in and of itself wouldn't really be that complicated when we have this many years to work that out. It's all the other variables that we don't know that make this complicated. So before we, we're getting closer to the question, to the you know, discussion period, but the next thing I, I think is worth looking at, it's also a chart we've seen before. It's diagram of the composite index and local ability to pay formula. So it shows you what the LCI formula is made of. And I wanted to include this. You've seen it before in work sessions in the past, but it's important to note that yes, revenues are part of it. Your local revenues are part of it, but it is the local true value of property, not the property tax rate that has any bearing on the LCI. So whether a locality chooses to over or under tax its, its real estate has no bearing on the LCI and therefore on our state revenue. So um, that's just something important to understand. Everything is moving relatively speaking, all the parts being moved relative to every other locality in the Commonwealth, but it's it's not the actual tax rate, it's the value of the property. And that value is not determined solely in the assessments either. It's, it has to do with actual sale value, market value, things like that, pay into that. I see what looked like some maybe some questions. So all the big calls there. Like basically, the state already knows what our value of the property value, and we're just we're seeing what the market value is. That's what we're seeing. Well, we're being funded on the rates that they know our tax value. I mean, our property values are even though we're not getting the full assessed value and or the full sales price value in our tax revenue. It's that the rate, however it's set by the locality, has nothing to vary on the side. It's about the values, and it's, and it's just important to point out, and I, I don't want to go beyond my depth here, but I, it, is, it is not, it's definitely not just the, the tax assessed value. So my point is the tax rate's not controlling it, and the assessed value may play into it a little bit, but if they do not just take the values from the local assessment. That is definitely not the market value plays in. So if we, you know, we in Charlottesville have had over the last year and a half um, a lot of examples of properties that have sold for well above the assessed um, price. And how would that affect? So those those things are, and there's actually um so um, that that's, work that's yes, yes. So one of the things that has come out in different analysis of the LCI, don't get me wrong, there are things in LCI that's complicated. There are things that work to Charlottesville's advantage. But one thing that catches every locality is that if you have just a few um, very expensive properties, um, those relatively few properties can have a huge um, impact. And, that was in a study, a VML, I believe, a VML report. I, I, I saw something about that when I was scanning just to make sure that I was sharing the right information. That that actually, that item was kind of pointed out. But I think that one that's happened. LCI is complicated, but the main thing is the decision on tax rate is not affected. Now, they got the committed aspect of it at the last meeting that we took a very important and I called Chrissy Hamill afterwards to make sure she she had already um, gotten a question from elsewhere in the city about it, and she comes to the same conclusion I did. So we, we've already talked about it, so I feel certain she also she would be answering that question as well, sharing that the same information I'm sharing with you. Two pound plus. Yes. Because that question well, the question came from, um, 
I don't really think the real life directly came from um, this founder, who's uh, someone else in finance, one of the directors. He was on the meeting as well. So we could share that with council. We can we can keep this in our we can keep this rolling in our slide deck. Um, it's good information to understand. And then the next slide is also related to the LCI because this is this shows you the relative uh, impact or weighting each of those factors has as a formula. And the most important factor that has the biggest it's the biggest driver on us yet is the ADM. So um, one thing that is unquestionable is that higher middle school enrollment numbers would boost our state revenue. They do. That, that definitely has to be there. So um, that's just a big point. Like, I, feel, I feel like we, at this point, I mentioned what Ed Valencia was talking about with respect to the, the students who would come in um, from out of our locality would increase our um, LCI by, by about a million dollars a year. So um, that so it's like even like the tuition would be dropping the bucket at the at the ADM value, just like the average daily students. It's, it's one of the reasons for the non-resident program, but beyond that, if we didn't have that um, attrition trend at Walter and Peter, that's gonna increase our state budget. Right. And I mean that's a Anywhere, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we had a lot more of our students in our building, that would be very helpful. Yes, absolutely. And um, yeah, that, that that's an analysis we we um, dove deep in in the past, as, as Mr. Key was referencing. She she had numbers right off the top of her head the last time we ran, and the impact of this non-resident was over a million dollars in additional state revenue. And my only point is, I have not actually thought about reconfiguration. In the context of the ABM and then subsequently the, the uh, impact it could have in our state budget. So, and, and, and that goes directly into our local support. Right. It, it's 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 additional revenue, um, and it's, uh, it's 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 important part. I mean, granted, the local support is defining for our programs, but state support is not. It, 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 it's a big factor for us. Yes. Yes. So, um, Tim, this is the year that, that we'll realize a new LCI. Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you. That was actually on the slide I forgot to cover it. I'm so, I'm not, I'm so used to looking up and talking to you all. I'm not doing a great job of following our slides. But below the uh, slide where it shows you the formula, the equation of the formula, there's a note that, yes, and we all always hold our breath for this. I'm looking at Renee um, because we have no idea how everyone else will be moved relative. Uh, so may sometimes get previewed in the amount and their analysts there because they can get their hands on all the data statewide. Jim Rector Ball does a good job of that. Uh, we will get that update in November-ish, late October at the earliest, hopefully about early November. Yeah. So that will be a very important moment for us in the process that actually leads nicely into the next slide, which is talking about all the different puzzle pieces that have to come together to develop a budget in any given year, and this year certainly no different. So let's just go through these really quickly. And this slide also refreshes us on the timing of when this information becomes known to us as we go through the process. So um, our enrollment projections and staffing recommendations based solely on enrollment, we can do that in the October, November timeframe as soon as that September 30 enrollment is finalized. And I know I, I have an upcoming agenda I don't think it's for October because that first October is a little quick to turn it around. We're still working on our numbers sometimes in the first part of October. But by November you'll you'll have that. So that's the first piece of the puzzle, if you will, that we just sort of get our hands around and do that work. Um, stakeholder input, we focus on that from November to January. And then the state budget, we don't have even an inkling of that really until the governor's budget is released right, right at the beginning of winter break. We always enjoy looking at that over winter break. And, but that governor's budget isn't the final word because as you well know, there are multiple other versions that come out until we get the final, hopefully usually around March, um, we get the final from the general assembly. And from the state budget, we're looking at you know our state revenues. And again, here's another note about a new LCI will be in effect for fiscal year 2023. The VRS rate is another important factor we're looking for around that time. The raise rate, and what I mean by the raise rate is whatever the state puts out as this is the raise we would like you to give, and this is the raise we're quote funding based on the LCI. 
we won't get into that, but it, that's an important number to realize because, or to be aware of, because that's the standard everybody tries to rise to. We, we can expect everyone, every other school to try to meet that rate. Just one, to stay competitive, the staff is already challenging enough. But two, you have to give that raise, and you don't get those state dollars. Um, I'm trying to think if they've ever prorated it, and I don't think they have, if you fall short of whatever rate they publish as the rate that they're um, looking to find on their side for a raise. But you think of the steps like that? Think, yes, so we get to count our step. So if the state says 3%, for example, um, we do a step plus a point 1.75 because one and a quarter is our step, and then the 1.75 gets us to the three. So that's how we handle that. And we, we qualify for the full allocation from the state in a 3% scenario, for example. So, um, but what's interesting and the reason I picked the graphic on this chart is it's this puzzle. Um, a, a lot of times, at least more recently, you know, if we do all of our work, and then we inform the city what we need to fill in that hole. If their piece doesn't end up fitting, it's it's really challenging. We have to go back and rework a lot of other pieces. And because the local funding is so key, it's really great if we can somehow work knowing what having some idea of what that central piece will be, and then we build out around that. It's an easier process. I'm not saying it's always possible, but it's it could become a process standpoint that's ideal because it's really at the center piece. So that takes me to this next um, slide, which I don't again, this is a graphic depiction of where my head was when I was thinking about just these dynamics of the budget process. So the challenge that we face is the board is charged, the superintendent board, us as staff supporting, we're charged with development of a needs based balanced budget. And anybody who ever does <laughs> budgeting work, either personally or professionally, knows there's a fundamental uh, angst or, or contradiction or work. A contradiction in those terms because you know we can need a lot of things, and you know, and especially when you're serving children, right? So there are a lot of needs, but there are limited resources, and that's the fundamental challenge of any budget process. And so the fact that the need-based piece and the balance piece of the budget are kind of fundamentally or inherently pulling against each other, that if you if you allow that to happen. It's not an effective process for, for dealing with the ramps and the bridges that we've got to figure out going forward to handle the, the non recurring funds effectively and work those out of our budget over time. What we have to have is sort of a process that's where the needs and the balancing act part of it are pulling against each other. We've really got to have that more of a circular process, somewhat iterative. But the problem is you can't have that iteration effectively at the last minute. You know, if you're trying to work back and forth because a number's been thrown over the wall, it's just not gonna, it's gonna really cause a lot of trauma and drama. And then the, the folks the council have been kind of late in the process, okay, these are the effects. This is what we're gonna have to do if this is the risk kind of thing. If that's all happening at the 12th hour, so to speak, or that's not good for any of us, it's not good for the city. Um, so the communication, I know it's, it's a little trite, but communication really is the key. To, to pull off a new space balanced budget in the best way that we can for the entire community. Um, communication early and often, and clear signaling helps. And I feel like the council has been sending some signals, and I think that we need to start engaging in some conversation around those signals just to make sure that, again, that there's some common understanding and, and that we are able to work through this budget process together in the best way possible. So with that, um, the next slide is simply just a reminder of the priorities that drove the FY22 um, budget development. And I just, again, some of this is just information I wanted you to have for ready reference as we move into the discussion part of the agenda. And the next slide has a half dozen questions that are, that are intended to help prompt the discussion this evening. I know you may have any more. Maybe better questions than what Renee and I thought of. But um, before we get into the questions, I did want to point out one other thing that's uh, in the presentation. And if they're following at home, but they'd like to go to the appendix. In the appendix is the FY22 budget change sheet. So you will have that readily available. 
The first section in the first section I highlight the salary actions and the non-discretionary contracts. This kind of goes without saying that this 3.3 million, almost 3.4 million, these are really the priority items to get out of non-recurring funding and over into recurring funding. There's just not much or any discretion to be had with those items at this point. Um, the next section in the appendix, this will be page two in the appendix section, where it has the $1,854,119. That is the school-based program supports and improvements. It's always where our focus is, as it should be, um, as far as changes outside of taking care of staffing and the non-discretionary costs. And I did attempt to go ahead and on the side there, I went ahead and broke it down for you so you can see how much of that was technology, which those are Zoom. I honestly now I can't imagine living without it. Because um, it's, it's been a real efficiency gain to not have to travel around town. Sometimes it's just so much easier to have meetings without the, the travel time, even if you're not so in the Mile City. But you've got the tech piece, you've got the FTE piece and the money for that, and then the stipends and contract adjustments. And then the last part is a mix. And my note in this one highlights some expenses are COVID specific or non recurring. And what I and I want to go ahead and highlight those, um, like the book room, for example. We don't think we need to invest in book rooms that much every year. I would consider that a non recurring expense. So that would be 60000 Not to say that something else might not come up, but um, the K 12 science supplies. Um, that may be recurring because I do know that's very material intensive and we've been struggling to keep up with that one. I believe the content squad stipend was somewhat specific to our situation while we're doing virtual and um, blended learning models, but that's something that when the time comes, Dr. Obi can speak more to that, but um, not tonight. I mean, um, but I'm just saying there's some things in here that may not be recurring. Um, the, and the mutual instrument maintenance and repair. Um, I think at least some of that does have to be in there as a funding increase. We, there's quite a bit of maintenance. Of the blessing of a, a very robust uh, orchestra and band program is there's a lot of insurance to maintain. And um, we had a sharp drop off in rental, rentals, if you recall, the, the children still, students still needed their insurance. And so the rental fees that were paying for those maintenance costs weren't available to sustain, uh, rental fees weren't available to sustain the full cost of maintenance. Anyway, the last slide in the appendix simply summarizes the rest of it. the COVID mitigation supplies. I look forward to the day where we don't need that. I can tell you, I checked with Renee, we spent about 45,000 of that 100,000 so far this year. Um, but that will not continue when we no longer have the COVID virus to, to deal with in the same way we're having to deal with now. And we always look at our staffing adjustments based on enrollment, we'll continue to do so. And then you can see the revenue. And we did have 391,000 in additional, net additional state revenue for the FY22 budget. That's why even though our budget increased by 4.9 million, the 4.5 that everyone is talking about, the council is very aware of, that's where that number is on the change sheet, that 4,571,000. Now, that number does not include the transportation increase which takes us to 4.9 million, and that's down in the blue. So, with that, I hope that was some helpful background and grounding information before we launch into the real purpose of tonight, which is discussion. So, I want to go through the questions really quickly, and then um, I'm happy to sit down and just you guys take over, and I'll be happy to answer whatever I can. Sure. Okay. Oh, absolutely. So, First question that May and I have is um, priorities. Uh, and, and I'm sure Dr. Burley will need this. You know, what priorities does the board want to establish for the FY 2023 budget development? So, looking at what the priorities were that grows 22, what changes or tweaks do we need there? So, priorities and then process. Um, this is a big question. How does the board want to approach programs in the FY 23 budget development in relation to funding from the city ownership? Um, and then the next two questions are really more about more about the city and the information we need to, to get through uh, communicating with them. Um, what is the commitment and timing for the 5% tax increase for school operations? What is, is there, what is the level of commitment for that and what are they thinking as far as timing? 
you know, that's the funding to flip the ramp, if you will, no matter on your side. But is it a given? And then will it be phased? Um, you know, those are those are questions. Are we going to do five cents all at one time? You know, that, a lot of questions there. And if the city funds the 4.5 million that's in our current budget um, through a real estate tax increase, what do we then want to do with our uh, CARES and ARPA funding um, to spend that out? And again, it's non recurring, so I'd be able to identify non recurring um, options and projects to spend that money. And then, last but not least, in general, what is the city revenue expense outlook? How soon can CCS expect a preliminary increase estimate? I will tell you the way it was for. Um, Leslie Beauregard would send to me an email and say, here's what the 40% of new properties are worth. And that was at Charlotte Point. That hasn't happened in the past, I don't know, it seems like it's a long time ago, but I guess it's been a couple of years maybe that we just haven't had that starting point. And that used to happen October, November ish timeframe. And that was just, you know, we wouldn't even necessarily share that number with you early on in the process with the board because again, you're charged primarily to develop a new space budget. And so we wouldn't want, you know, we just kind of start there. It was viewed as a starting point. But a lot has changed. Um, which leads to the next question Are changes being considered to the baseline funding formula? Because I believe I've heard some. Um, Comments about that. I don't know. I don't know what that means. And so these are discussions that are um, big discussions, I think. And so those are the prompt questions. I'm happy to say that that is just a bad either way. Thank you. Get comfortable. Thank you for that. For coming together. 